series face to face. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Guess what? This is my first sermon as a grandpa. Yeah. So I thought we'd start the first five minutes with some pictures and videos. If you turn to the screen, I'm just kidding. Now go with me to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Hebrews 4, 14. I encourage you to find it in your on your phone, on your Bible app, and your paper Bible to practice following along. It'll help you in your own Bible study. Um, but we always have the screen that we can uh, always fall back on. So um, if you've got uh, <clears throat> this, I know the series image is in front of you. You've, I heard people giggling on the way in when they looked at the bulletin cover. And uh, all you have to do is look at the slide image, and you know where we're heading these first couple of weeks, right? As we talk about face-to-face, we are living in, a, in an increasingly polarized us-versus-them world, aren't we? It's just true. And the public rhetoric is increasingly hateful, and so if it's like that in public, what the world, how are people talking, uh, you know, behind closed doors, right? I mean, the div- and the divisions in our society just continue to go deeper and and as we begin another stressful presidential election year, did you know there's going to be a presidential election this year? I don't know if, just let you know, in case you didn't get the word, right? We know it's bound to only get worse. And on top of all that, our screen-addicted, info-overloaded, social media culture is doing more harm than good. It's true. But I got good news today. See, I am a preacher of good news. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The good news today as we start the new year is that there is an answer, there's an answer, and we have the answer. Yes. There's a source of healing for the open wounds of society, and it is the way of Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And as I hope to show in this message, it is the way of face to face. It's a way that can only be lived out through an abiding, transforming relationship with Jesus. There's no other way that you can live the face-to-face way. You've got to have an abiding relationship with Christ in which he is in the process of transforming you. That's the only way you can live this way. So that means a couple of things. The first thing it means is this. The world cannot live this way. It does not have the resources to do so. In order to live the way of Christ, you have to surrender yourself to Christ. You got that? You got to make him king of your life. And if you're living in the world, you're living according to the ways of the world. If you have not, you have not surrendered to Jesus. So so this is a couple of things that, so then church, listen, we need to quit expecting people who aren't citizens of heaven to live by the ethics of the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because they do not have the resources to do that. Now, the other thing it means is this. Listen, if if the world is broken and polarized and divided and and we're the ones that have the answer to it, then you know what this means? As followers of Jesus, we do not have to look anywhere else for the answer. We already have it. Can I get an amen for that? We simply need to take a closer, deeper look at what we've already received. And that's what the New Testament book of Hebrews is all about. We've come to Hebrews chapter 4. The book of Hebrews is really not a letter. It's a sermon that was being preached and written and distributed. This is a sermon, right? And the message of this sermon, as it was delivered in the first century, was this. It came to people, and the message was this. It was reminding them that no matter what the challenges that they are facing in their current world, they already have the answer to the challenges. And so this is the message for us today. We don't know what 2020 is going to entail. We don't know what we're going to face in 2020, but we can have this confidence. We already have the answer to it. Come on, amen. Already got the answer, right? That's the message of Hebrews. And so so we don't need to look backwards. We don't need to look side to side. Friends, if you're facing fresh challenges, there's no answer for you looking backwards at the way you used to live. There's no reason to look to the side or over here. You just keep looking straight ahead to the Jesus that you decided to follow years ago. You keep looking to him. Amen. That's the message of Hebrews. You keep looking and focusing on Jesus. And that's the theme we're picking up on in Hebrews chapter 4, 
verse 14 on the screen. Check this out. Or on your lap, whether you're, wherever you have it. Look, th look at this. This is in the New International Version. Look what it says. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hone firmly to the faith that we profess. Now, the original audience receiving this sermon were Jewish Christians. And we know we know that the priesthood was an important part of the religious life for the Jewish people. We've been immersed in the Old Testament, right, this past year. We're going to stay immersed this year. And one of those things we've learned is how important the priesthood was. They were the mediators of the people before God. And so they would mediate the relationship and bring the offerings for sacrifice and keep that reconciled relationship and forgiveness flowing from God to them, right? But here's what this sermon says to us today, that when God sent his son, he sent them the once and for all perfect high priest to lead the way into the very presence of the heavenly father. What he's saying here is Jesus is God's final answer to our condition, to the human condition. And so here's what they and we need to keep doing. Hold firmly to him. Don't look back. Don't look sideways. You keep focusing on Jesus, and you keep following in his way. Now, what is said next in this sermon is critical for understanding the way of Jesus. Look at verse 15, and keep following with me. Check this out. He goes on to say this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. What makes Jesus such a great Savior? Well, there's a lot of things, aren't there? But the thing that he's focusing on here in this verse is this, that one of the things that makes Jesus such a great Savior is his ability to empathize with our human condition. How did he do that? Well, he did it by what we just celebrated, right? In fact, we haven't even taken the decorations down yet. You just look over here to stage left, and we see how he's able to empathize with us. God, the Son, became a human being. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for that? Yeah, that's how he did it. Earlier in this sermon, the preacher would write this. He had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. How is Jesus able to empathize with us and be such a great Savior? Because of the incarnation he took on flesh. So this uh, word in the original language that we have translated here, empathize, is the word sympatheo, sympatheo, and it means to feel or suffer with. Now, many translations use the word sympathize, right? And if you've got a new King James or King James, it's the word sympathize. Uh, but I appreciate the NIV going with the word empathize because hasn't sympathy become a, a, a word that's kind of lost some of its meaning over the years because what the preacher in this sermon is talking about is not kind of pitying people from a distance and sending in the Hallmark card. That's not what this is about. What this is about, this idea of sympatheo, to feel and suffer with, this is about entering, being present in another person's suffering. It's feeling what someone else is feeling. And you know that empathy is an important ethic in the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth these words as he was talking about the church as the body made up of many different types of members, all different and yet united in one body in Christ. And he made this statement. He said this. He said, its parts so should have equal concern for each other. Why? Because they're all part of the same body. And so he says this. If one part suffers, every part should suffer with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. That is this ethic of the ability to empathize with somebody else. When somebody is going through it and they're suffering, that there are other people in the body that are suffering, entering into being present in that other person's suffering. That is this idea of empathy. And this is something we've got to be intentional about developing because it doesn't come naturally, does it? But the next verse calls us to respond accordingly. 
The, the obvious response then, since we have a superior, empathetic high priest, what should we then do? Look at verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What's he saying here? He's saying because Jesus became one of us, because he's been where we are, because he willingly entered into our pain and our suffering, right? Because he became a baby, grew up to become a man, because he took our flesh upon himself, right? He knows, he gets it. And so because he gets it, we can move close to God with confidence. It's like a teenager who has a father who always remembers that they were once a teenager too. And so because they are empathetic to what you're going through, because they're not faking it and they realize they were once a teenager and they made the same stupid mistakes you've made and they've been through the same stuff you've made, now you can come to dad with some confidence that he's been there, he gets it. And he knows what you're going through. Can I get an amen from some teenagers today? Amen. This is the power of empathy and why it's such an important ethic in the body of Christ, in the kingdom of God. See, we can say it like this. Empathy creates the security to move close. When you enter into somebody's life that's hurting with empathy, then what happens? You become a safe person for that suffering person to open up the window of their soul. People can let their guard down when somebody shows up with empathy. Right? You become disarming. Some people walk in the room and everybody puts their guard up. Well, that's not a follower of Jesus. It couldn't be because you're following the way of Christ. And the way of Jesus is the way of empathy. When Jesus showed up, people felt comfortable, put their guard down. Whoa. He knows. He feels what we feel. It, it, it will take that relational distance and shorten it. Come on, amen. It will take the us-them polarities, and it will bridge them, right? Oh, this has such wonderful application in so many areas of life. I mentioned parenting. I mean, Honestly, if, if, if you want to keep an open door with, with your children as they grow up at every stage, you keep practicing empathy. You keep being a voice of empathy in their life. Man, you cannot be successfully married if you have not learned. You can't be happily married until you've learned how to empathize with your spouse. You've got to enter into their world. There are many things about men and women that are the same. There are many things about men and women that are different. you got to enter into that world and be empathetic. Sometimes empathy comes a little late, but better late than never. Lila and I are now three weeks in the grandpa and grandma business. You know this is going to come up every sermon for a while. You know that. <laughs> and we've been down in Charlottesville for several nights and helping out, and I'm just reminded of how much work it is when there is one eight-pound little human being that's completely self-centered and self-absorbed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was in the hospital for the first diaper change. There were four of us. I mean, it was just like, you know, it's like. <laughs> you know what's happened because of this over the last few weeks? I, Lila has grown in my eyes. We've had conversations because, you see, when we had our three babies, the first two, we were in Chicago all by ourselves no family around. I was a youth pastor at a church, pouring myself into church and youth ministry. And I said to Lila, you did all of this? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I said, I really didn't have a clue, did I? And she said, Can I say something? Lila rocks! Man! Wow! It's the power of empathy. It, friends, empathy will keep you close. You, in any relationship, in any friendship, right? And we take it a step further. Empathy not only is for the relationships you have, but empathy enables a relational connection that did not previously exist either. 
When you operate in empathy, you have the ability to open up avenues of friendship that the world would think it could never happen. You know what? You become a bridge builder. You see, because God and Christ moved close, became one of us, he bridged the gap at the cross, became our forever empathetic savior. We now no longer have to be enemies of God. We can let our guard down. We can respond to him. We can become friends of his, his children, part of his family. And that means brothers and sisters, one another as well. Oh, can we just give thanks for the empathy of our great Savior? Come on, would you just give praise to the amazing power of empathy in our Savior? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now listen, without empathy, you'll never be able to obey Christ's command to love your enemy. He's called us to love our enemies. In a divided world where everything's polarized and people are demonizing each other, do you know what Christians are called to be? Different. Because you're a citizen of heaven. We're called to love our enemies. You see, friends, you've come to a church today. I know there's a few of you maybe that are, you're, you're getting off on the right start. You're going to the gym and church. Come on, amen. Thank Jesus, right? It's January. Praise God. You've walked into a church. You know what our mission statement is? Helping people follow Jesus. We're not just about helping people find Jesus here, but helping people find him and then follow him, which means this is not a place to be, we're not really concerned about keeping you comfortable here, but helping you follow Jesus here, amen. We're called to love our enemies. And friends, this is at the center of much of the hate and polarization that plagues our society today. People have lost their ability to empathize with those who are different than themselves. And this has bled into the church. We categorize, we polarize, we pick sides, and then we demonize the very people that Jesus has called us to love. Mm. One row, I believe right here in section B, is really excited, and then it feathered in a little bit here. That should have started a wave at church. Mm. Without empathy, we're relegated to stay comfortably huddled only with the people that think like us, look like us, talk like us, opine like us, yes, believe like us, yet vote like us. And somebody think, well, what's the matter with that? What's the matter with that? Just staying huddled with the people that you're comfortable with. Well, it's not the way of Jesus, for one thing. It's not the way of true community. It's not, it's not the way of the body of Christ, unity and diversity. It's not the way of mission. Staying huddled with the people that you are comfortable with is what Paul called Peter out for. Check it out. In the letter of Galatians, he says it. You see, what Paul would do when he came to a city is he would preach the gospel first to the synagogue and Jews would get saved. And then his next question is, where are the Gentiles? Oh, they're over there. And he'd preach to the Gentiles. And then these churches would, take, would, would be born with Jews and Gentiles. That's why he had to write letters and chapters about food. Because you had different cultures. In the first century, there was only one place where you could find Jews and Gentiles breaking bread together. There was only one place. It was the church of Jesus Christ. That was the only place you could find it. Do you know where the only place where you're going to find true racial reconciliation today? In the church of Jesus Christ. The people that have the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit. Pop, you... Read Galatians. Paul called Peter out on this. Oh, Paul's not, you know, the, the, Peter's there visiting this church. I think it's Antioch. And he's eating in the diverse table. I mean, it's the body of Christ. They're breaking bread together. But then these religious Judaizers who, who, who still had this wrong idea didn't have the whole gospel, right? They came. And what did Peter do? He left the diverse body of Christ table. And he went over here to just eat with the Jews, the comfortable table, to stay in the comfortable little ghetto where everybody looks the same and thinks the same and feels the same, where it's comfortable. Friends, what's wrong with that? It is not the gospel. The gospel reconciles us to God and then together as one another in the body of Christ. You can't have one without the other. 
Amen. Amen. There's no substitute. How, how do you develop empathy? How do you develop it? How, how do you learn empathy? Only one way. Face to face. There is no other way. No shortcuts. When it comes to the all-important ability to empathize with another person, there's no substitute for face-to-face in the flesh relationship. It's the Jesus way. Even God, would, could, even, even the rescue operation required God to show up in the flesh so that he could feel what we feel and experience what we feel. That's how this all works, friends. There's no other way but face-to-face. It's the Jesus way. The Apostle John communicates the face-to-face way of Christ powerfully in the opening declarations of, of his letter to the church, 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to cheat like the rest of you. I'm not going to look on my Bible, and I'm going to look on the screen with all of us. Let's all look at it together because I want us all to read it together. Here, here's how John describes Jesus face-to-face. Let's all read it together. You ready? Let's do it. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. Look at the words there. Look at how he's describing three of the five senses, right? When Jesus showed up, what is the witness from the apostles? We saw him with our eyes. We heard him speak. We felt we touched him with our hands. He could have thrown in smell too, right? He had B.O. like the rest of us. Became one of us. And then John shares the glorious outcome of the face-to-face experience with Christ. Let's read the next verse. Come on. Loud and strong. Don't poop out on me now. Let's read it together. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Because we have the witness from the apostles. Because we have received the witness from the apostles that God himself showed up face to face. Then we also now can have fellowship and a face to face relationship with each other. The word fellowship is the amazing word in the Greek, koinonia. You've probably heard of it before. It has to do with commonality and community and sharing and reconciliation. Friends, what's happened? Jesus led the way. He set the example. Do you know what Jesus did? He bridged the biggest polarizing us versus them gap ever in the history of the universe. You think right now Democrats and Republicans can't get along. You think about a holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being the us, we're the them, fallen humanity that said, thank you, God, but we're going to do our own thing. Aren't you thankful that God didn't up in heaven say, well, you know what? We're not going to cross this bridge. Poop on them. It's us three and no more, Father, Son, and Spirit. Aren't you glad that God said no? We're going to step across the largest divide in the universe. I'm sending my son to take on human flesh. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's what the gospel of John says. He bridged the gap. He became one of us. Moved into the neighborhood. And he calls us to follow his lead. If you're going to follow Jesus, you can't just find him and say, thank you, Lord. But he calls us to follow his way. But here's the challenge. Facebook is no substitute for face-to-face. In fact, Facebook is often the anti-face-to-face. Our participation in the screen-addicted, info-overlated social media culture is robbing people of the necessary skills for basic, healthy relationships, not even to mention the higher calling that you have, the Ministry of Reconciliation. One of our pastors shared with me several weeks ago an experience they had going to lunch with several young people. They were going to Panera's, and you know that if 
the Paneras that you're going to is cool, like the one in Gainesville, you have this option you can order from screens now. It's very convenient. I don't talk to anybody. Order off the screen. So they showed up and a little lunch with some with a little group, four or five of them, and, and they walked into Panera's and and the people all, all all the people that were there, they got in line at the kiosk for the screens. And there was a line. There was a couple of kiosks and there's these lines for the screens. And then the, my, my pastor said to me, he said, but but behind behind the counter were people and there was nobody in line. <laughs> and and so this is what we're dealing with right now. We got like People are screen. People are screen. But listen, this problem cuts across all generations in every demographic, you bald, gray-haired people, you. There are many great books being written about this issue by people much smarter, more in touch than me. I'll quote just one of them. Pastor and urban missionary Dan White Jr. in the book, check out this title, Love Over Fear, Facing Monsters, Befriending Enemies, and Healing Our Polarized World. He says this, as informed as we think we are, most of us inhabit information silos of broadcast, print, website, and social media where our own preferences repeat in echo chambers of increasingly hostile, narrow thought. I'm going to say it one more time. As informed as we think we are, most of us inhabit information silos of broadcast, print, media, and social and website where our own preferences repeat in echo chambers of increasingly hostile and narrow thought. Our time-saving devices are depleting our tolerance for the relational process. First week of July 2016, three and a half years ago, I started on a more intentional personal journey that I had, I had been on this journey for several years before that, but three and a half years ago, the first week of July 2016, I, 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 I doubled down on this in a more intentional way, this journey I've been on. And I'll remind you what that week was. My pastor friends on, my, on the preaching hymn are going to immediately remember Pastor Kevin's out there. You know the week. It was the week that Micah Xavier Johnson ambushed and fired upon a group of police officers in Dallas, Texas, killing five, injuring nine others. That happened on the Friday of that week. Earlier in the week, there were two controversial shootings by white police officers of black men. One was Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the other was Philando Castile in Falcon Heights, Minnesota. Now that week, like most people, I got the bulk of my news and information for my preferred media outlets that come at things from a perspective that I'm most comfortable with. Went through that week, got to Thursday preaching team, and the preaching team said, Pastor, you can't preach the sermon you're going to preach. We need to address this with the congregation. Some of you will remember three and a half years ago. So we went through that week, and um, I was getting all my data. And of course, I knew the facts. I knew the facts. And you know, the narrative that comes to a person that looks like me and thinks like me tends to be this. Well, you know, this is just the liberal media stirring the racial thing up controlled by the Democrats, if they keep it stirred up, then people of color will continue to vote for them and they'll keep having power. This, this racial thing, I mean, come on. Civil rights was a long time ago. We've made so much progress. You just need to get over it. It's not as bad as they're making it sound. Just get over it. Let's move on. I had the facts. I had the data. But as we got to the end of the week, Lila and I had something in the pit of our stomach. I knew that I could not preach Saturday and Sunday without taking a step I'd never taken before. I called up my dear friends who are part of Chapel Springs, who are people of color, probably the closest 
friendship I have with people of color. Because Lila and I begin to talk and ask ourselves, well, I wonder what they think. I wonder how they're feeling. I wonder what they're going through. And so we invited these friends over to our house on Friday night, and we had the kind of conversation that we'd never had before. Do you know what we were doing? We were following the way of Jesus. You can't empathize with your brothers and sisters of Christ at arm's length by some talking head who has their own agenda who's going to tell you exactly what's going on. You've got to move close. We ask questions like, tell me what it's like to be African American in Manassas. Tell me what it was like when you started a business here. What was it like when you raised your kids? What was it like when you had conversations with your son? Were they different than the conversations I had with my son? And for two hours, Lila and I began to understand as we listened with an open heart and a humble posture to a side of things that we would not have gotten any other way. Now, I know it's dangerous to clap like this because we can't do anything around the church anymore without it getting political. And I wonder, where was he saying something about Trump? Was he saying something about Nancy Pelosi? Should I clap or not clap? What are they doing? Are they clapping for two or three people? <laughs> so I've been on this journey for three and a half years now. And some of you know, I mean, I've had a lot of conversations. I've read a lot of books. I've opened up my heart. I want to learn. I want to grow. Some of you were with us a couple of years ago when we did the Justice Series, and you know. So there's this other issue, Middle East, the Israelis and the Palestinians. Well, everybody knows, everybody knows the truth about that. Israelis are good, Palestinians are bad. It's the fact. I got the data. I got the news feeds. I know. But then we have this Palestinian family that attends Chapel Springs, and I've known them for decades. And I sat down with my friend, Sammy Kula. Sammy, are you here? Sammy's here. <laughs> you know what I decided to do? Face to face. You know the way of Jesus? You know how Jesus got into our skin? It's the old saying, stop criticizing, walk a mile in somebody else's moccasins. And I asked Sammy questions. You grew up in the West Bank. What's it like in the West Bank for somebody who's Palestinian? What's it like in the West Bank for a Christian Palestinian today? Because he goes back there. He still has family there. He, he has a whole different perspective. I got a whole different perspective that I never would have gotten from a talking head or from somebody's blog or from somebody's news feed. It only happens one way. It happens face to face. That's it. Let's not practice the ways of the world when we're the only ones that have the answer. Let's try the Jesus way. Hallelujah. Let's live the Jesus way. Praise God. If you're going to follow the way of Jesus, you've got to develop the ability to empathize with those that are different than you. I'm not talking to one group here. I'm not the white guy talking to all the white people. I'm Pastor Scott talking to his congregation that is diverse. Hallelujah. Maybe you grew up, and because of the way you grew up, and where you grew up, and you were a person of color, you grew up, and, and you just have this, na your natural default is not to trust the police. My dear friend Josh, Pastor Josh, has gotten pulled over countless times for driving while black here in Manassas since he's been here. I'm sorry, bro, but I got to say it. It's all good. Right? So maybe you're a person of color and you've copped an attitude toward the police and your thing is all police are jerks and all police are after me and all police are... Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, this is for you as well because we have some people in this church that are police officers yeah. and they love Jesus and they love people and they're doing their best. And I don't know what it's like to put on a uniform and put my life on the line to try to do something good for society, to protect people. Come on, amen. Friends, this is for all of us today. 
for every one of us today. You got to put a fence around your convenient devices and choose the less convenient, time consuming, hard work way of incarnational, in the flesh relationships. We got to turn from pride, embrace humility, admit that we don't know everything just because we're informed by our own, our own, own pursued, preferred websites. There's a time when every one of us, no matter who you are, where you came from, there's a time for every one of us where the best, most Christ-like thing we can do is shut up and listen yeah. in humility. Yeah. If we're going to follow the way of Jesus, God bless you. We've got to learn to not do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But rather in humility, value others above ourselves. Not looking to our own interests, but to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. Let go of his own advantages. Let go of his own privilege. Made himself nothing. Took the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness. Humbled himself. Became obedient in the way of the cross. As we begin what promises to be a challenging 2020, I want you to know, I'm filled with great hope and confidence. I want you to know that I've never been more eager, excited, or ready to preach or lead this great congregation as I am today. Amen. And I'm a grandpa with a pacemaker. <laughs> Some of you are just hearing about the pacemaker thing. Don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> Got a pacemaker, dude? Do we want to go here? Just a little electrical thing, not plumbing, electrical. If you're curious, generosity part two on YouTube, Chapel Springs YouTube, I tell the story, okay? It's okay. I may be battery operated, but I am spirit empowered. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. I've never been more excited starting a year leading this congregation why? Because I know there's an answer to the division and the anger and the hatred and the polarization of this broken world, and we have that answer, hallelujah. It's the way of Christ Jesus. What a great opportunity to follow him in these turbulent times. It won't be comfortable. If you want to be really comfortable at a time like this in the presidential election that we're going to have, you better go to a church where everybody looks like you. And everybody opines the same, thinks the same, and is going to vote the same. You'll be very comfy cozy. But that's not Chapel Springs. It's not Chapel Springs. It's not Chapel Springs. When you're in a church that's committed to racial reconciliation, when you're in a church that looks a little more like heaven... When John saw it, he saw there's going to be every people group, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every ethnicity. What was he seeing in heaven? Color! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! You want to go to a church that looks a little more like heaven, then years like this are going to be difficult and challenging and stretching. We're going to be swimming against the stream, but it's going to be good. It's going to be right. It's going to be honoring to the Lord. Do you know what America needs to see? Diverse, multiracial churches. It's what America needs. Because if racial reconciliation can't happen here, what hope is there for the world? We have the cross. We have the gospel. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. So as I leave this church, I ask you for three things this year. You might want to write them down. Be wise in your use of social media and don't expect it to do what only face-to-face -face presence can do. Stay on Facebook. Stay connected. Share pictures of your grandkids. <laughs> Send out encouraging messages. Build people up. Use it to share prayer needs. Intercede for each other. Don't use it to let off steam about the latest thing you're ticked off about in the culture or the politics. Don't let off steam about Nancy Pelosi and what she said. 
Trump what he just tweeted. And do you know what happens when you do that? You just invite all the people that think like you to have a public puke party. The other thing that happens is that handful of friends that don't think like you, that were in a class with you at Chapel Springs, who went across the aisle and befriended you, on, and they're looking at your puke party and what you're saying, and they have a completely different perspective, and they're like, what in the world is that? But you don't have the opportunity to have a face-to-face. So don't use it for that. And by the way, thank God for our live stream. How many have ever used our live stream? And you were sick, you were on vacation, you're deployed, you're on a business trip, and you're watching online. Don't I look good on TV? <laughs> my mom always said, my dad was said, my, my son's on TV. Dad, it's the internet, it's not the same thing. Let's use it when we need it, but there's nothing like personal presence of worship in the body of Christ. And I'm talking to the choir because you're here today, but some of y'all have been six weeks, right? And I'm looking right in the camera today. There's people watching right now. Get your butt in here if you're not sick next week. Amen. I'm a grandpa and I just don't care anymore. All right, let's wrap this up. The second thing I want you to do, other than being nice to people, (laughs) intentionally make friends with those who are different than you. Listen and seek to understand their perspective. Join me on this journey. It's made me a better person. It's made me a better Christian. I've exercised muscles that I I hadn't exercised before. It'll promote empathy and strengthen this fellowship. You see, we can't just be happy with the diversity we see in the big room. It needs to happen in our living rooms, in our dining rooms. I challenge your life group. Take a close look. Does everybody think too much the same and act the same and look the same? Is there enough diversity in your life group? Make friends with those that are different from you. You know, I've had conversations, and many of the conversations, you know what, we're not going to change each other's minds, but you know what's going to happen? We're going to understand people's perspectives better, and we're going to learn to empathize better, and we'll become a stronger congregation because of it. Come on, amen. Amen. And the third thing is this. Remember who you are and to what you've been called to. We're not Americans first. We're citizens of heaven first. We're the church first. We're the body of Christ first. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's what the Bible says. Our first job is not to try to change the world, but to bear witness to a different world. The one that Jesus brought. Remember, Jesus, Jesus, the gospel isn't, repent, take heart, because I've come to change the world. No, the gospel is this, repent, because I'm bringing a new world to this earth. It's the eternal kingdom of heaven. You're citizens of that kingdom. And so let's, the only way, we we won't have an impact on the world until we first are bearing witness to a different kind of a kingdom. And so never forget who you are first. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. Now you know what's going to happen. You can't preach a sermon like this without holding hands. So you might as well slap on a little antibacterial before you even get up. I just preached the gospel today. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. Amen. This is the gospel. Thank you, Jesus. Can we pray for the person on our right and on our left right now? Just begin to pray right now. God, I just lift up my brother, Josh. God, I pray this to you, Jesus. Lord, for growth in Christ, Lord. I pray, Jesus. Lord, that you would lead him in your path. Father, that he would walk the way of Jesus. That he would grow in his ability to empathize. God, give him friends that aren't like him. Stretch his muscles, Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name. Can you join me in praying for this local church? Could you join me in praying for Chapel Springs? In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for what you started. Several years ago, you began to 
bring color to this church. Several years ago, you began to make diversity a part of the fabric of this church, and we thank you for it, Jesus, and we know the enemy doesn't like it. And so, God, I pray you protect the unity of this church, Father. May 2020 not be a damaging year, but be a strengthening year where we become more and more like Jesus and look more and more like heaven in the family of God, the body of Christ, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you'd give us the courage, the desire, the want to, to put feet on this sermon. And not, not just to be, well, wasn't that a good sermon, but to do it, Lord, to live it, to take steps, to take steps to follow you in the hard way of incarnational living, becoming bridge builders, going across the gap. Jesus name would you strengthen us and God we pray for the body of Christ at large God we thank you for the we thank you for the church in America would you strengthen the church father would you give us more diverse churches more churches that can reflect that can reflect the glory of heaven father to a world that doesn't have the answers may we celebrate and live out the answer of following the way of Jesus we pray God, we pray for our president today. We pray, Lord, for Congress and for all of our elected officials in Virginia and at the local level, God. Lord, we're, we're hearing rumors now about, about potential for conflict and war and the thing that has happened with Iran and Iraq. And God, we pray you'd give our president and all of our leaders great wisdom, sensitivity. Lord, we pray, Jesus, for, for truth, for righteousness, God. We pray, Lord, that you protect those protect the innocent, our brothers and sisters, in Lord, living in Iraq and Iran and difficult places. May your protection come. Father, we pray for peace. We pray, Lord, for cool heads and for, and for good statesmanship. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we not enter into further conflict. There'd be no more destruction and death, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We pray for this year, Lord. We know that we know, Lord, that elections matter and that politics matters and that, and that it's not something to pull away from. But, Father, help us to bring our Jesus-first behavior and attitude and insight, Father, this year as we fulfill our duties as citizens on earth. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it, Father. Strengthen us, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Can y'all extend your hand to our pastor as he's leading us in this time? If you've ever been in a position like this, this is hard. So be strong and courageous. Amen. Father, I Amen. pray for our pastor, God, that you would allow him to be strong and courageous, God. Lord, he's not leading us in the ways of politics. He's leading us in the way of being biblical, of following you, following your way. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would encourage him, Lord, as he says what you are telling him to say, as he does what you are telling him to do, Lord. I know it won't always be perfect, but Lord, I pray your grace and mercy to follow him, God. I pray for the people that follow in this church, God, that we would not just open up our mouths and just talk stuff, Lord, that we would pray, that we would stand with him, that we would stand with the word of God and that it would be the rule in which we live. Father, go before our pastor, give him peace, to know that he's doing exactly what you've called him to do and be. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's give it an amen. Come on, let's give it an amen and Praise thank the Jesus. Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Josh. I love you. Amen. All right, listen. This is one of those sermons, and you know what? This isn't the last time we're going to talk about this. It's going to be a fun year. Praise God. We're going to learn the gospel. We're going to live the gospel. Amen. Now, here's the thing. It comes to an, imp you know, I'm not perfect, and I might not have quite said something where I should have said or didn't qualify something, or you know, and, and if you're here and you just heard this wonderful message and, and the Holy Spirit wants to do a work in your heart because of it, the enemy wants to, wants to help you focus on that one thing that, you know, he really could have said that better. And that'll help you avoid the true work the Spirit wants to do in your heart today. Don't let that happen. Come on, amen? Let's let the seed of the gospel take root and bring forth a harvest. God bless you. Let's go live for Jesus. Amen.